All right, it says we are streaming live on Facebook. Uh, welcome everybody. Uh, this is Emerging Revolutionary War. We're uh, having a special evening tonight to talk about uh, probably the, the center of the Revolutionary War uh, in the early American history, and that's George Washington. Uh, and uh, it's a particularly important we talk about him on this evening uh, because it is uh, the night before the federal celebration of George Washington's birthday. Uh, so make sure you tell all your friends it is not President's Day. Uh, <laughs> the actual holiday right. is right. Washington's birthday. Uh, you know, he often gets uh, short change or other people are thrown in there, but Washington has his own holiday in this country. Right. Uh, and it's important we recognize that. Uh, and so uh, tomorrow's the, the official recognition. Uh, Washington, of course, was born on February 22nd, which is Tuesday. So, um, but we're, we're joined here tonight by a, a good friend of the Emerging Revolutionary War. That is uh, Tom Hand with uh, Americana Corner. Uh, if you don't already follow them on social media, go ahead, check them out. Uh, they're always putting up great content um, and uh, telling the stories of many of the, the early uh, founding fathers. Um, and you can see this wonderful t-shirt, which we actually uh, got. You can see John Adams there. Uh, that, uh, he was gracious enough to uh, uh, donate for our, uh, our tour we did of Trenton and Princeton in November. Uh, and, uh, it was a sellout, I believe, right? Yep. Yeah, yeah. We sold out our uh, first tour and our second tour is coming up in uh, this November and is almost sold out as well. So uh, if you're interested, check out our blog, EmergingRevolutionary.org. And you can uh, get a ticket for our, this trip, which is going to be another, it's going to be focused again on George Washington. It's going to be uh, Valley Forge and Monmouth, uh, which Washington... Oh, okay. Uh, was going to be, and that'll be this November, same Veterans Day weekend. So if you get a chance, uh, check that out. Um, but Tom, uh, welcome uh, again. Uh, he came on here a, a couple months ago and, and talked about uh, founding fathers in general. Uh, but we decided we needed to have a whole separate session just on uh, George Washington. Um, but go ahead and introduce yourself to our audience. Uh, tell them a little bit about uh, what America on a Corner uh, is and, and what you guys got going on uh, on your site. Yeah, th thank you, Mark. You know, first of all, thank you for inviting me back. Uh, and uh, it was just great fun on the first uh, uh, trip down this path. But um, I started Americana Corner, uh, I guess it's been almost two years now. I uh, sold a, a cheese company that we had up in Wisconsin, Go, Go Badgers. And um, uh, came down to the southeast to start uh, getting closer to some of the stories about which I wanted to write and uh, just a couple of things uh, met a couple of people and um, uh, this website uh, Americana Corn has just been a real blessing uh, labor of love if you will and uh, it's it's so much fun researching uh, the, uh, the great men and women of our nation's past and the events that that shaped what we are today uh, I want to mention uh, Sherry Green and Lauren Dennison, uh, the two gals that helped me uh, manage my uh, my website and do the videos and stuff. And uh, anyway, yeah, just uh, happy to be here. All right, yeah, now, yeah. and we got. I, I'm looking now. We got people coming in to us from Connecticut, from Arizona, Pennsylvania, Ohio. Kentucky, Illinois, uh, Florida, all over the country, people listen in. So thank you, everybody. If anybody has any particular questions or anything like that, drop them into uh, the chat and uh, we'll see if we can answer some of them about Washington. Uh, but let's go ahead and start. Uh, you know, Washington's born uh, uh, in 1732. Um, you know, he, he grows up in Virginia um, and then you know, in my mind, like I said, he's, he's the center of the revolution. Uh, and that's something that you guys had talked about last time, uh, that Washington was the, um, you know, he, he's really, I think the best term for him and the historians have described him as is indispensable, the indispensable man of the revolution. Uh, talk a little bit about uh, why Washington was so important to our revolution. Well, you know, it's interesting. I don't know <clears throat> that, uh, I think the revolution uh, uh, would happen uh, with 
without Washington, but uh, without him, uh, we certainly would have a, a different result. Um, it, it's hard to, uh, to really appreciate the task that was given uh, to George Washington to take command of uh, really a rabble, uh, an untrained uh, militia, uh, 16 to 20,000 strong, depending upon who you uh, listen to or read. And um, they, were, they were tough to, um, to lead, uh, untrained, uh, poorly clothed, poorly, you know, the, the, their weaponry was, uh, was not what the uh, British forces had. And they were facing the most formidable uh, uh, force in the world. And, um, you know, and, and so that's, that's the task that he had in front of him. And I know people have uh, criticized some of his, uh, um, his generalship. Uh, Long Island comes to mind, uh, you know, and some other things. But, um, but you know, a, a good commander, uh, General Eisenhower, General MacArthur, uh, a General Lee, they have great subordinates, and uh, you know, it was really uh, General Washington and uh, a couple of good subordinates, certainly uh, Nathaniel Green and Henry Knox come to mind, but uh, without him, without him holding that together uh, through all the adversity, I just don't think we make it to the end of the war the, the way we did. The, uh, he was a, the glue that held everything together, and until you've been in command of, a, of, a, of a, an army, I don't think you can appreciate how hard that is to keep these people together. And remember, uh, they, they, they couldn't get paid. They were poorly fed. Um, they had morale issues. And yet this guy somehow held it together. And, uh, and he was there for them. Uh, I think in eight and a half years, Mark, he only went home to Mount Vernon 10 days. Now, he was a commander. He could do anything. No one's going to tell him no, but he was so disciplined and so devoted to the cause. And I'll get off my soapbox, but I just, uh, I just think he was the guy that, that could make the result that happened happen. What do you think about that? Oh, absolutely. I mean, you talk about his personal sacrifice of, you know, yeah. If, and if anybody hasn't been to George Washington's Mount Vernon, I was just telling Tom, uh, before we started that, you know, the, the, my love of history was, was born a lot from visiting that site uh, and walking where Washington walked in. You know, I think Washington described it as uh, the, the most pleasantly situated estate in all of America. Uh, mm -hmm. And it is a beautiful spot. And thanks to the preservation work over the years, you know, you can stand on the, the back porch of Mount Vernon or Piazza and look out and it looks almost exactly as it did uh, over 200 years ago. And yeah, right. you have to imagine like uh, uh, the fact that he's giving that up uh, for yeah eight years um, is, uh, yeah, his personal sacrifice is, is tremendous. Uh, and, you know, another thing about Washington is, you know, he was the man of action from that time period. Uh, I, you know, you say it's hard to imagine, you know, how the war is going to end up the way it is. And yeah, there were more experienced military people that could have been chosen for that job. Mm -hmm. um, but, uh, but Washington was selected and, you know, he had this, you know, a, a great resume of, of having fought during the French and Indian War. And I think that his, his personal bravery on the battlefield was the thing that stood out the most to people. Uh, when you talk about at Braddock's defeat, Washington had four bullet holes through his coat. He had three mm -hmm. horses shot out from him, hat shot off his head. I mean, uh, there was even a, a preacher in Pennsylvania who gave a sermon shortly after and said uh, that the, the man is destined by divine providence to do something great for this country. And I've always said there hasn't been more prescient words ever spoken. Uh, and that was back <laughs> in the 1750s. Um, so it's just... Uh, you know, uh, the, the fact that his, you know, his actual actions, and I think that's something too that comes through through the revolution. Uh, you can see the painting behind me of, you know, Washington being with it, you know, him being with these guys throughout that whole time period was so important. And they looked to him as their, their leader and they would stick by him through thick and thin. And he was always willing to be on the front lines with his men too. Um, and I think that, yeah, he, he just summed up leadership for his men. Um, but, you know, there have been, you know, great leaders throughout world history. I mean, you look at Alexander the Great, you look at Julius Caesar, you look at Napoleon, you look at all these guys who, 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 who do the same thing, um, but they don't necessarily, you know, use their greatness for good. Um, and I think that's what separated Washington 
from everybody else. Um, and ultimately, you know, I think his, his greatest act, the act that he should be remembered for all time for is his giving up power. Um, and I can't speak too highly of that. I mean, you go to Baltimore today, there's a giant monument to George Washington. And at the top is not Washington on horseback, not with his sword, not, you know, as president, it was him turning his commission over. Yeah. That's what's memorialized there. And I think, you know, it's so rare in human history to give up power and, and Washington defied all those expectations. Uh, and it's truly amazing. Well, yeah, and he didn't do it just once. He did it twice. I mean, yeah. <laughs> this, this guy is, was, was so special. You know, it was one of those perfect storms of things happening. You know, if George Washington was 20 years older, he's not the commander of troops. You know, if, he's, if he's 20 years younger, 10 years younger, he's, he's too young. Uh, you know, and, and so, it, and then these things happen that, you know, they needed not only a first commander, they needed a first president. And, um, and so he's there for both opportunities. And uh, for someone in that time period, remember that was a time period of hereditary uh, monarchs. It was a time when um, no one, uh, whether you were born as king or prince or whatever, gave up their power. Uh, military men like uh, Napoleon, uh, once they assumed power, they, they stayed in power. Kings, uh, once they put on the throne, they, they stayed on the throne. Uh, only George Washington, uh, to my recollection from back then, um, gave up uh, power. And twice, once when he had commanded the army. Uh, and remember, uh, it wasn't just turning in uh, at Annapolis. Uh, he was uh, it, uh, encouraged by uh, the people in Newburgh to, um, to, to push, use the military, to demand from Congress uh, the, 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 the pensions that uh, the soldiers had been promised and then they had a legitimate argument. But even then, uh, despite his frustration with Congress, um, despite his uh, thinking that the, uh, the soldiers had a, a valid complaint, um, he still urged caution and he still recognized that the military was uh, subservient to uh, the civilians. Um, and, and that's big. And no one really talks much about the Newburgh conspiracy, but that was a, uh, you know, we were at the, at the precipice and, and he was there to, to rescue us. And then you know, eight years into his presidency, uh, people wanted to run for a third term. He was concerned that it would become a, a hereditary position and it couldn't happen here, um, despite uh, people, especially the Jeffersonians, talking about him wanting to be a monarch. That was so far from the truth. And, uh, and then he stepped down again, uh, surrendering power to John Adams, a great man also. Um, and so twice he walked away from the chance to be king. And I don't know how many guys could do that. It's, it's, it's pretty incredible. Oh, absolutely. I mean, he had even officers in his army writing him letters saying, you know, monarchies are a pretty good form of government. Like, you know, it'd be great. And, you know, you can only imagine somebody <laughs> telling you, hey, you know, you'd be, a, you'd be a great monarch. And then again, it's like, I think, I think it's Washington's, you know, true understanding of, uh, you know, liberty and uh, self-government and the importance of that. And you're right, that's so rare uh, <laughs> to, to find somebody, you know, like I said, you look at some of these other, uh, Charles Lee, you look at Horatio Gates, you look at some of the other people that would have been top contenders for Washington's job. Had they been commander of this army, I don't see them necessarily turning down that opportunity. Um, and mm -hmm. I don't see most people doing that. So it's uh, truly unique about his character uh, that he understood that and was willing to, and actually did it. And like you said, did it twice. Uh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> now, if you had to uh, pick out one uh, uh, thing from his, his younger days that really stands out to you, what would you pick? Say pre-revolutionary pre, pre time. Uh, that did what? Well, that had an impact, I suppose, on, on, on the country, on his uh, on, uh, forming the man that he became. I mean, like I said, I think I think his military service during the French and Indian War was was, was huge in him being able to, to position himself to power. But I'll, I'll give you a good story, uh, one of my favorite Washington stories that a lot of people don't realize. 
Um, and if anybody wants to read more into these stories, you can check out, uh, there's a great Washington scholar. We've actually had him speak at one of our symposiums, uh, Dr. Peter Henriquez, and he's written a great, great portion of Washington. But I think one of the early stories of Washington, and you know, we can go into, this is great too for his birthday. We can talk about, you know, his mother. Uh, I think that's a sure. great story. But I think one of the, the lesser known stories of Washington uh, where his life could have taken a vastly different trajectory was his relationship with Sally Fairfax. Uh, Washington, oh, okay, yeah. uh, <laughs> Washington growing up uh, in, you know, in the Northern Virginia area is brought into kind of the Virginia gentry and the yeah. Fairfax family at, down at Belvoir Plantation. Um, and, uh, and, and is likely uh, it, it t taken very much aback by uh, Sally Fairfax, um, who's married to one of the Fairfax boys already. Um, but Washington takes a liking to her and uh, there's, you know, Washington actually writes her a letter uh, saying, you know, mm -hmm. hey, we should go ahead and, you know, like some character in a play, run off and live our lives in happiness and, you know, reject society and, you know, fall madly in love. Uh, and it's just a fascinating story. And so here Washington kind of puts out his hand or whatever and, and Sally rejects this. Uh, she doesn't respond. And just a few months later, Washington ends up being engaged to Martha and, you know, goes off and, and, and becomes the man he was today. Uh, mm -hmm. Sally Fairfax, uh, her, she and her husband are actually loyalists during when the war breaks out. So they actually go back to England. Uh, Washington corresponds a little bit with her uh, over the years. Um, and then, you know, later in life, Washington dies. And then when she dies in the early 19th century, they find in her drawer that letter that Washington wrote her all those years oh. back, you know, so, so, so she held on to this letter. So it's clear yeah. that she had some feelings for Washington. Uh, and yet she said no to that whole arrangement. Um, and uh, that, huh. that changed the course of history. Uh, so we should thank Sally Fairfax for being uh, uh, being uh, good to her husband and uh, rejecting the offerings of uh, Washington. And uh, even though I'm sure she had feelings for Washington as well. So just an interesting story of, uh, and you also get a hint of Washington, not as the old man, the stoic face we see yeah. on the, uh, the yeah. $1 bill, but the young man who has his options in front of him and doesn't know necessarily what he's doing with his life. Uh, and uh could have taken a drastically different course. So, uh, well, yeah, you're right about that. The, um, you know, it, it's interesting. He was uh, fatherless after age 11, I believe. I think his dad passed away in uh, 1743, I think, um, and uh, was kind of raised sort of by the Fairfax clan. I uh, spent a lot of time there, and and uh, his half brother uh, Lawrence, um, you know, and. Uh, it, Lawrence passed away, I think, when uh, George was uh, 20. And, um, you know, and so at 20, he, uh, he had one of the big landed estates in, uh, in Virginia. You know, even there, the, uh, um, it's sad that Lawrence passed away uh, from, I think, from tuberculosis. But, um, you know, and so if, without his demise, his dad's passing away, you wonder, you know, what would have happened to, to George? Would he have gone down a different path? But, um, uh, he's he's quite a remarkable. Uh, I won't say self-made man because he certainly had more than than most that he got started with. But um, poorly, relatively poorly educated compared to Jefferson and, and Adams and some of the guys. But um, uh, it, he was he was such a uh, he was smart enough to to uh, um, know that he needed to make a living. Uh, he became a, a surveyor. Uh, you know, and you wonder how that hardened him, how it made him uh, you know able to handle the field command. That was coming up, and uh, and by the way, his, his first field command was when he was only 21 years old. Um, you know, pretty impressive for a 21 year old, to, you know, to be in command of that kind of a. I think it was a 300 man force. Didn't turn out well at Fort Necessity, but uh, but still at, at age 21, pretty impressive, I think. Yeah, I think uh, his ability to grow is uh, yeah. pretty yeah. remarkable. I think some some of those things that kind of turned him down, you know, could have easily spiraled him out of, you know, wanting to seek, uh, but he, he seems to learn from his mistakes and, and try to do better uh, the next time around, which I think is, 
you know, admirable and um, in that respect. Uh, so what else do you think, what, what do you think is the, the defining moment of, of Washington's early life that made him the man who he was? Well, I think um, the, the British uh, um, <clears throat> passing on uh, uh, George Washington uh, for a commission. You know, uh, George Washington wanted to be a British regular. Um, and uh, the British said no. And, uh, you know, you could do all kinds of what ifs, but uh, George Washington as, a, as a, a commander, a colonel, a general in the British Army certainly doesn't become the head of the Continental Forces. And, uh, and, and so I, I think, I'm not a psychologist, but I suspect at that point, uh, he started getting some separation from, uh, from, from England. Uh, you know, he was spurned. He was a proud man. Um, proud people don't like being spurned. And, uh, and, and then I think he went back, he did his, his own thing at Mount Vernon, um, working the estate. At, but uh, he got involved in the House of Burgesses, uh, you know, our, our, one of our first assemblies. Um, uh, lost one election, the only one ever lost, his first election he ran for in uh, 1757. But I, I think that shaped him. I think he, he started getting some distance from, uh, his, I don't see his loyalties to the crown, but um, at some point in that time period, uh, British colonists started thinking of themselves as Americans. And I don't think it was a subject, or a, a, a thing they said, I'm gonna start thinking about it today. But if you start read, if you read back, John Adams, he wasn't there, and all of a sudden he he is there in the uh, becoming an American as opposed to just being a British citizen. George Washington, that whole transformation mentally kind of started happening after he was spurned by the uh, the British government, um, and I think at some point they started thinking, you know what, we're not really them, we're us, and I think that's why the American Revolution uh, took hold. Um, they weren't treated badly. I mean, American. British colonists, they, they had it better than almost anybody else in the world, except maybe those people in England. They certainly were treated better than French colonists or Spanish colonists. Um, they didn't live under an absolute monarchy the way they did in France. Uh, and so the American colonists had it pretty good, but uh, we had grown up. And uh, you know, it's like a teenage kid when he grows up, he doesn't wanna live at home anymore. And you know they, we had grown up right in front of their eyes, you know, through their neglect. The British had not really taken care of the colonies that well. And uh, yeah, anyway, so I think that that really pushed him off that uh, being part of the British Empire thing. And um, I see that as a defining moment, but uh, I don't know. It's always fun to kind of think about, isn't it? Yeah, no, I, I think that's, uh, you know, I think that being passed over for, you know, the ability to advance himself uh, in the empire, I think, I think that really made it personal for Washington. And I think it's interesting because you look at, you know, I think we tend to think of Washington as this more conservative figure, but he, you know, he was an early, uh, you know, proponent of the cause of American liberty. Um, and it's just interesting to see, yeah, that transformation coming across. But yeah, I think, I think, I think that, you know, be him being treated essentially as a second class citizen or whatever within the British Empire uh, helped make that personal for Washington himself. And you're right. I mean, you, like I said, you look at Mount Vernon. I mean, he, he seemed to be doing all right for himself within the empire, but it was it was being not given and then how they see how the other colonies are being treated, you know, with the uh, the Tea Party after the Tea Party with all these intolerable acts and everything else like that. I think that only yeah. strengthens Washington's resolve in, in the cause of American independence. Yeah, when you uh, uh, read about the uh, the progression of events, uh, starting with the uh, you know the even the uh, the Proclamation Act of 1763 and then the, the Sugar Act and then the Stamp Act and so on, um, it it was really a, a, a series of, of blunders on the part of the British Empire. I don't, I don't think England recognized how independent we were, and and then you know then everybody got their backs up. And uh, and when that happens, you know you're gonna you're gonna have a fight, and that's what happened. But uh, um, tell me about your thoughts on uh, the Washington presidency. Now, uh, his his uh, field command obviously didn't win a lot of battles, but he won the war, and that's what wars are about: winning the war, not the battles. And so, tell me about his presidency. Are you do you think he was a 
successful president or not? Uh, I've always said, you know, George Washington is the only president who didn't complain about his predecessor for all the problems. That <laughs> That's true. <laughs> That's true. I mean, ultimately, that is Washington has the most difficult task of any American president. Uh, he's coming into it entirely as a new everything he does is setting a precedent. Uh, you know, he can't, uh, you know, every speech he gives, every, you know, you know, every reception he hosts, every dignitary he talks to, it's all setting precedents that, you know, are going to be criticized and then are going to be either uh, altered or whatever. Um, so he has a, he has, a, you know, like I said, one of the toughest jobs. Uh, and, uh, you know, he does his first term, uh, you know, I think he wanted to retire after the first term and he was kind mm -hmm. of, talked into to doing the second term uh, and does that. And, and uh, yeah, I just, uh, thank goodness he survives to this because I think you're right. If he dies at some point in either the first or the second terms, uh, there's a precedent of the executive stays there till his death. Um, but, uh, uh, you know, second term is gonna be, you know, there's gonna be a lot of controversies, you know, of course, I think the biggest one's probably the Jay Treaty uh where he's really uh you know and you really have this fractious country i think a lot of people forget um you know everybody says well, washington was the first president that was his accomplishment his accomplishment was keeping the country together uh, a lot of yeah. people don't realize yeah. that the whole the seams of the whole country were literally coming apart uh yeah. you had every empire around the world you know salivating waiting for this doomed republic to break apart so they could go and swoop in and take over the portions they wanted uh, and Washington's the unifying figure that even though, you know, the Jeffersonians and a lot of these others are, you know, really criticizing him and uh, upset with some of his policies, I think, I think everybody respected the man. Uh, and I think he, I think he represented the, uh, the unifying force and, uh, and then, yeah, lives to give up power to John Adams, which again is another you know unheard of thing in in yep. a world ruled by despots and monarchs uh and gives up power and goes back to mount vernon and it's uh so i i yeah i consider him i think he's the greatest president in uh our country's history and i think it's because of the unique position he was in um and there are things that you can quibble with you know i definitely you know how he handled the whiskey rebellion can be you know hot, hotly contested the way he handled the Jay Treaty, the way you handled, you know, so, some of the things he was doing can be highly criticized. Um, but, uh, uh, but at the same time, he was the first and he was doing everything on his own and he was keeping the country together. I, I don't know if you can ask him, uh, the man for more than that. Uh, what about you? What do you think? You think he was uh, a yeah. great president or? <laughs> I do, you know, he, uh, to me, he was uh, what a president is supposed to be. Uh, he didn't exceed his authority. You know, um, he uh, he lived by the Constitution, and uh, you know he. Um, there were times when he would he would go to uh, other people, uh, ones that wrote the uh, the Constitution, and uh, talk to them about if if this is legit, if we can do this sort of thing or or not. Um, you know, the, the Jay Treaty was a perfect example. Uh, um, I, I feel he was a, a a great president for all the reasons you stated. But he showed he showed deference. He showed uh, humility in office, which you know, frankly, it'd be nice to see happen in a few presidents now. Uh, he his job, according to the Constitution, is to uh, you know, promote the general welfare, welfare you know, secure uh, the safety of, of citizens, um, and and so he focused on staying neutral. Uh, he didn't. He didn't get into wars that we couldn't afford to fight for a lot of reasons. Um, uh, he he uh, was diplomatic, you know, even though he was in, antagonized by uh, both sides, he, he didn't uh, take the bait. Um, <clears throat> you know, he didn't send uh, 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 young men uh, to war to their deaths uh, necessarily the way that uh, his, some, many of his predecessors did. Um, you know, even though they never fought, a lot of politicians today uh, are quick to be uh, war hawks, but they never put a uniform on. Uh, you know, I think of Dick Cheney, uh, you know, four to firmest in Vietnam, and he's always talking about going to war while he was, in, you know, the vice president. And so 
George Washington knew what war was all about. And, and I think he showed tremendous deference uh, his proclamation act, uh, his neutrality act, excuse me, um, I think was uh, brilliant. Uh, it, it angered a lot of people. There was strong feelings uh, about that. Um, and he kept us at, at peace and, and he, he tried to keep debt at a low level. And if you read his, uh, his farewell address, it's all about unity. We don't have political parties because we need to stay united. Uh, don't incur debt that will pass on to our children and, um, and don't get involved in foreign alliances where they get into a fight and we get drawn in. That's not really our fight. And um, if you take a look at our history uh, and all the troubles that we've gotten into, most of those can trace back to our failure to follow his advice uh, in his farewell address. And so, yeah, I think he was, I think he was the best president the greatest president ever, certainly to set precedents and so forth, um, you know, and, uh, and he had no one to follow. And so, uh, yeah, I, he's, uh, and I think maybe that's the greatest thing he did was he taught everyone else how to, how to follow his example. Yeah, no, and, you know, you talk about, you know, he's kind of, you know, he writes the, you have the farewell address he gives where it focuses on, you know, his kind of, you know, words to posterity on, on this republic that they had, created uh and yeah that you know still are read in uh congress today and yeah if only uh we could get people to listen to uh you know these this advice is still relevant you know over 200 years later i think it's uh um really important uh to th think about you know and I, I think that's also something that you know we take for granted is the country we have today is as this one big united country uh and that the fact that it wasn't at that time um, and that traces back to, you know, Washington, again, being a unifying figure with the, the Continental Army. Uh, when you had the Army together, this is the first time people from North Carolina and Connecticut were in, you know, the same area together. And, you know, yeah. had, you know they considered these themselves separate countries. And here was this Continental Army of all of these different uh, people. And they were all under the command. I mean, I think that's a big part for why Washington was selected to command was that he was a you know, multi-generational Virginian. Um, and I think that that is, uh, played an important role in showing that the whole Revolutionary War was not just a New England rebellion. It was a united front between all these different uh, colonies that soon became states. Um, and Washington, I think, yeah, was that unifying figure. And you kind of see that, you know, as the years go by after Washington dies, there's you know, more divisions and, you know, eventually it's going to, you know, they ultimately do break by the time of the Civil War. But uh, before that, you know, Washington, that's how important he was in, in keeping the country together. So, uh, and so that's why I think his, that's his, you know, unity was like his big thing that um, his lasting impact for the country um, and something that everybody could respect, uh, whether they were from the North or the South or east or the west um and so and i think we you know by the time you get to like the american civil war both north and south are claiming george washington as their own um so he he maintains that sense of unity uh all the way throughout his death and his legacy no uh, when he was president george washington that is um he had uh in my mind a, a great man as vice president uh john adams um but he wasn't close to John Adams. And why do you think that was? Uh, that's a good question. Uh, you know, one of uh, me and my wife, we like to watch the, uh, the HBO John Adams series, oh, yeah. which is yeah. really great. Uh, I think that uh, the actor who portrays Washington and that really, David Morris, he, he does a fantastic job of really getting across, you know, uh, what Washington would have been like. Um, but, uh, but yeah, one of the, the scenes in there shows, you know, how, you know, Washington kept John Adams out of different meetings and stuff. And it seemed like he was very flippant about uh, Adams uh, uh, throughout that. And yeah, you read in, in, you know, whether it's McCullough's John Adams or any of these other books, you know, they, they, they do talk about how, yeah, Washington seems to keep Adams at, a, uh, at length. Um, and that's a good question. You know, I, I'm not positive exactly you know, one of the things that's interesting too is because I think Adams tries to follow, you know, he's another president who had almost an impossible task of having to follow up 
George Washington as president. Um, yeah. And, uh, uh, but yeah, I'm, I'm not sure exactly why, you know, it may be, I'm not sure. Uh, why do you think? Do you have any ideas on that? Well, I don't know. It's, it's interesting uh, that uh, two uh, um, of the first uh, uh, four cabinet officials were key subordinates in the army for, uh, uh, for General Washington. Uh, mm -hmm. Alexander Hamilton is a, a colonel and Henry Knox uh, as the major general chief of artillery. Um, and um, it's interesting, Washington was also close to uh, 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 James Monroe, uh, a good subordinate, uh, and John Marshall. And, um, and I, I, I don't know, uh, I've always thought that uh, uh, George Washington uh, um, stayed loyal uh, to his, uh, his men, uh, you know, the, the band of brothers. And I, I personally believe that, uh, you know, John Adams wasn't in that band, um, nor was Thomas Jefferson. And, uh, you know, John Adams, he was just a stellar man. And, uh, he was a, a true patriot. He was everything good, but he had never been a soldier. And I, I wonder if, uh, uh, George Washington, the man was just drawn to that band of brothers. And that's, and, and, uh, and so when, it's interesting when uh, Alexander Hamilton left uh, the cabinet in uh, 95 and, uh, and uh, Henry Knox about the same time, um, Washington started turning more to John Adams, uh, perhaps out of necessity, I don't know, it's hard to say, but um, I think uh, I've never served in, in, in combat with anybody, but I bet you get a, a, a bond that you just don't get when you just, you know, working together. And so I always thought that was the reason that he didn't, it wasn't anything against uh, Adams. Um, it, it's hard to fault John Adams, to be honest. And I also wondered, you know, George Washington was one of those guys who, um, you know, he, he did what he was, thought was, he was supposed to do. And I don't know that he felt like the cabinet included the vice president. And I think that's part of it. I think he always kept, uh, you know, so I think that's, maybe part of why he didn't uh, get close to, to Adams, but at the end, I think he did a little bit closer than the beginning. Yeah, no, and I, you know, I think it's interesting too, to see, uh, and again, I think that's part of Washington's presidency is, you know, setting these precedents of, you know, what is, you know, even John Adams, I think was trying to feel out what the role of vice president was, yeah. even though I think he <laughs> came up with it, what is the most useless uh, position there is. Uh, yeah. um, and, uh, but yeah, Washington, you know, in Adams, you know, I think there's some great letters between Abigail and Martha Washington. Um, yeah. And we can talk a little bit about Martha too. I mean, how important is she in Washington's life? I think that she's, she, she plays such a significant role in support system to allow Washington to be able to achieve many of the great things. You know, I think say behind every, great man is a great woman. I think Martha uh, is, is an important role in Washington's life. Well, you, you forget, you know, Washington was human and he was uh, prone to loneliness like anybody else. Um, and, and Martha, uh, you know, when they got married, she was actually wealthier than, uh, than, than George. Um, uh, you know, she's a widow, I think at 27. Uh, she was married to uh, Park Custis and uh, and anyway, and so, um, but she traveled to, to share his hardships. Um, and that says a lot about her character and, and people don't talk about her. Uh, they probably talk about her more now than they did, you know, in the last century or so, but uh, she, was, she was quite a gal and, uh, you know, she didn't need to be on center stage, but she was there, she supported him and um, she was everything that, she, that, she, that he needed her to be. And, um, and I think, I don't, you know, I, I think they're a great match. They're a great pair. And um, I think they were stronger together. Yeah. And so I think she was, uh, she's certainly not uh, well known today. Is she, people don't know a lot about her, her background. Um, but uh, yeah, I think she was a perfect match for him. Yeah. I, you know, I, I always mention how every winter encampment that Washington's in during the war, like we said, he, he's away from his home for eight and a half years. Uh, yeah she comes out every winter to be with him uh, and to visit with the troops as well. Um, and yeah, you know, I, in many respects, you know, I think she's, she's very much a tragic figure in the sense that you see, yes, she was married first and her first husband died. Of course, her parents died. She has four children. Uh, two of the children died young. Uh, the other two live older, but they both die. 
uh, and then uh, and then George Washington dies. I mean, so you know, she experienced you know quite a, a, a amount of death uh, around them, which of course was typical in the in the 18th century. Um, and uh, and but yeah, but she she perseveres, and and you know, she has the precedent of setting you know what a first lady does, and um, yep. and you're right, yeah, I think oftentimes she gets overlooked. Uh, I do want to mention too, uh, you know, we talked a little bit earlier. I just want to bring up, you know, Washington and his mother is an interesting story too, because you, you mentioned uh, how Washington wanted to be in the, the British Army. Uh, he was also thinking, you know, as a young man about going to join the, the British Navy. Um, and, uh, and it was his mother who told him uh, no and stopped him. And, uh, and, and his mother often in history books can either come across as, you know, uh, really hard on George. Um, I think he, she lives all the way up until uh, Washington is inaugurated president. Uh, so she lives for, for quite a while. Um, and, and during the war, she's actually petitioning the Virginia legislature for, for money because she feels like that uh, George had abandoned her. Um, and George had to quickly explain that, you know, he was taking care of his mother. Uh, so some people can be very hard on, on Mary Washington, his mother. Um, but Mary, you know, widowed, uh, you know, does it herself, uh, raises George uh, the last few years. Uh, and shows him, you know, the, the importance of, you know, doing it yourself. And, um, and, and I think she's a character who's been getting more and more, people have been focusing more on her and that uh, she played an important role in young Washington's life and was quite an interesting person in her own right. Um, uh, but it's kind of interesting. And you can actually go down, uh, she lived in uh, Fredericksburg, her house is still down there. And uh, uh, you can actually tour that. Um, oh, I didn't and, know that. Yep, and uh, and actually, uh, uh, you know, uh, his boyhood home, Ferry Farm, is right across the river from uh, Fredericksburg. Uh, I'll be actually taking my family down there tomorrow for the they're doing the children's events for Washington's birthday. So I think it's a a great site, you know, uh, that you can learn more about Washington and his early life, uh, which is pretty interesting. So. Another question for you, Mark: If you had to pick one guy from American history. Uh, most like Washington, who would you pick? Ooh, that's, <laughs> that's tough because there's few people who, you know, come into the, the same realm as Washington as far as, you know, his importance. Um, you know, what, what's interesting is, and a lot of people don't realize, is uh, uh, there's one, another major character in early American history is Robert E. Lee during the Civil War yep. era. And uh, he's actually marries Martha Washington's granddaughter. Um, yep. So he marries into the, the family. And uh, uh, I see a lot of the same qualities of Washington and Lee as far as uh, deference to civilian rule, duty to, um, uh, to, to the military, uh, off and away from his home as well. Um, and then, uh, of course, you know, where his loyalty lied as far as between Virginia and the United States government. Uh, was the most painful decision Lee had to make, and he ends up going with Virginia. And of course, you know, gets uh, you know a lot of people uh, criticize that. Obviously, um, it, it, what Washington would have done in that same situation, I could see it very difficult for Washington as well. Yeah. Uh, what would he do in that situation? You know, some people, I think Jefferson said that he would have gone uh, with the United States government if such a break happened. Um, but, you know, we never know. It's a, it's a big what if. But I think Robert E. Lee is, you know, he's in that same sphere of Washington as far as um, yeah. uh, uh, trying to decide what to do. Um, but yeah, no, I mean, it's tough because there, 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 there's few people, and you mentioned, you know, if he was born 10 years earlier, he'd be too old. If he's born uh, yeah. 10 years later, be too young. I mean, there's few people who are in that same situation as Washington. Uh, I don't know if he had really has another, um, uh, you know, an, another person who, who's on that same level. But what about you? What, what, who do you think would, would, would come close to that candle? <laughs> no question, Robert E. Lee. <laughs> so you answered the right, you had the right answer. Okay, yeah. we're on the same mind here. Okay. Well, you, you, Robert E. Both Virginians. Mm -hmm. um you know they both had a i'll say aristocratic backgrounds but maybe didn't have the, the big silver spoon in their mouth uh, you know 
Robert E. Lee's background, and I know you know a lot about him. Um, both military men, uh, both uh, called marble men in their personality, uh, you know, both uh, you know, physically imposing men. Uh, um, they, uh, they both rebelled against their mother country. One won and one lost. And, but they both did the same thing. They, they did what they thought was, was right. And uh, uh, men of uh, tremendous personal character um, where, it, and you can't put a, a price on that, where someone does what they say they will do. And like the, the, the shirt you're wearing right there, Mark, always stand on principle, even if you stand alone. That's John Adams' quote, but uh, boy, George Washington and Robert E. Lee lived it. And you could say, well, Robert E. Lee swore an allegiance to the, um, to, the, to the uniform of the Union, okay. But George Washington was a British citizen. I mean, and so, but we don't hold that against them. They, they did what they thought was right. Uh, and, and anyway, both great men. And then both succeeded uh, beyond the uniform. Uh, Washington with uh, the presidency and uh, uh, Robert E. Lee as the president of uh, what is now Washington and Lee University, uh, taking a, uh, a backwater uh, two building school and turning it into a, a prominent Southern university. Uh, and, and more than that, uh, advocating for peace and reconciliation and um, the, the some of the people today uh, that are talking the loudest um, don't uh, give uh, Robert E. Lee the, uh, the credit for his uh, talk about reconciliation. The, uh, the Civil War did not have to end in 1865. It could have continued in an unpleasant manner uh, and, uh, and he helped shut that thing down. So uh, anyway, he's the guy that I think, you know, and honestly, if he had said yes to accepting President Lincoln's offer to command the Union troops, we would never have known uh, President Grant, we would have known President Lee. And um, anyway, one of those what ifs in, in life. Yeah, and uh, you know, and just one other comparison, I mean, you mentioned the military aspect in the fighting and I, I'm interested to know what you think uh, uh, Washington's finest moment was, um, and I'll give you a second to think about it. I'll tell you what I think Washington's finest moment is. Right. That is on uh, uh, January 3rd, 1777. Um, you know, behind me is the, the crossing. Uh, yep. You know, I wrote a book about the, 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 the 10 crucial days of Washington crossing the Delaware and the battles of Trenton and Princeton. Uh, and it's very likely that the, the entire war, uh, the rebellion would have been ended uh, had Washington not done this crossing and fought these battles. Um, and so he crosses the Delaware on Christmas, wins the battle at Trenton, wins yeah. the second battle at Trenton, and then uh, on the night of January 2nd, 77, marches all the way around the British army while you know Cornwallis is stuck there. And he attacks Cornwallis' rear guard at Princeton. And there's a battle going on there, and it looks for a second like the, the British are going to uh, snap Washington's line in half and defeat him, and that this whole campaign would have been a failure. Uh, and it's at that moment uh, that Washington rides up to rally his troops and uh, rides through the smoke, comes right up, uh, rides in between the British and the American lines. He comes within 30 yards of British troops. Uh, both the British and the Americans level their weapons. They all open fire. There's smoke engulfs the scene. Uh, you know, one of his aides covers his eyes, thinking that he's going to see Washington shot down in front of him. Uh, and then here comes Washington through the smoke, unscathed. Uh, and, and one of the soldiers, you know, writes a letter to his wife afterwards and says, "When I saw him brave all the dangers of the field, his important life hanging as it were by a single hair, with a thousand deaths." flying around him. Believe me, I thought not of myself. Uh, and of course, the Americans rally, they charge bayonets, and they drive the British off the field. Washington wins the battle, wins the campaign, saves the revolution. Uh, but I thought that moment uh, where Washington was willing to risk everything uh, uh, for his belief in the cause, and uh, I, think, I think that was a turning point for it secured that glue of his men willing to do anything for him. 
uh, and, uh, and, you know, would be, you know, passed down through the years in story and paintings and everything else as this great moment in American history of Washington at the Battle of Princeton. But I always think, you know, whenever people ask me about Washington, you know, if I want to sum up, you know, his importance in this, uh, in early American history, I use that as the example of showing, you know, this was a guy of action. This was a guy who at the moment's notice would do anything. Uh, and, uh, and, and so I just think that's, I think that's my favorite Washington story uh, that I love to tell. Do you have any, what's your favorite of the Washington, many Washington stories? Well, I have to tell you, you, you uh, I could listen to you tell more Washington stories. That's, uh, <laughs> you are an enthusiastic Washington believer. Good for you. At, uh, um, when you first asked me that, the two things popped in my head, the uh, crossing the Delaware and, and uh, the January 3rd battle at, at Princeton, but, uh, and so uh, I won't repeat your thunder, but uh, you said it beautifully. Um, you know, you wonder, um, do you believe in, uh, there are men of destiny? And, uh, you know, here's a guy, you know, here's a guy gets uh, what, two or three horses shot out from under him at the Battle of Monongahela, four bullet holes in his, his outfit. He, he charges at uh, Princeton, never touched by a bullet. I mean, he's, He's 30 paces from British regulars. He uh, charges into the fray at Monmouth, I believe. And, uh, um, but, uh, you know, but if I had to pick one thing, it's that painting behind you. And only because um, they, were, they hadn't had anything go their way since, uh, uh, you know, since the British evacuated Boston on March 17, 1776, nothing had gone their way. You know, they, they, they lose, uh, Long Island, they lose Manhattan, they lose the White Plains, they're, they're retreating. No one's supporting them. They go from 16,000 troops down to you know, 4,000 troops. And then uh, I think um, Sullivan shows up with 2,000 more guys. Um, and so, you know, a lot of guys would just say, we're done. But, but Washington, that perseverance, nobody else had this perseverance. And so he takes these 6,000 guys and says, you know what? You, the enlistments are expiring in five days. We got to do something. And so he organizes this, this uh, Hail Mary across the, uh, the Delaware. And you know, there were actually three uh, forces that were supposed to make it across the Delaware. Uh, and only one made it, his. And partly because he had Henry Knox with him, to be honest with you. And that's a whole other story. Henry Knox is a great evening to talk about sometimes when we uh, have more time but anyway so here's a guy who hasn't caught a break hasn't won anything in nine months he's gone from 16,000 troops to about 4,000 troops um it's it's a snowy blizzard night uh there's ice chunks flowing down the Delaware uh and he grabs some boats and they get across this ice choke thing when when two other units said, you know what, it's too tough, we're not gonna do it. But with Henry Knox's encouragement and Washington's own determination, they make it across this river. And now they had to get horses across, 18 pieces of artillery, ammunition. I mean, look at those boats behind you. I mean, I guess that ice choked river and he didn't say, I can't do it. He did it. And so he got across, you know, he has to divide his force again, Sends some on the lower route and some on the upper route, and uh, and he takes the Hessians with no casualties, no deaths anyway. Captures a thousand men, you know. It, it was just incredible, and now they believed in him. And then, of course, a few days later, uh, Princeton happens. But I don't think Princeton happens if this doesn't, if the crossing doesn't happen. And so I get a little excited too talking with George Washington. So I'll uh, I'll turn it off there. <laughs> No, you're absolutely right. You know, that's what, for the book I wrote about Trenton and Princeton, you know, the, the best word is the, the password of the whole uh, event, yeah. which was victory or death. Victory uh, or death. Absolutely right. that, you know, he, he, you know, he didn't have a choice at that point. So uh, no. he had to do something. Uh, and, and it's just amazing that it, it worked out uh, for him. And Washington always attributed uh, that victory and other things to divine providence. Uh, I mean, whether it's the weather just play, happening perfectly and 
you know, having the right people at the right time is, is, it's amazing that our revolution was as successful as it was. We often look back on this history and well, then he crossed the Delaware, then he did this. And it's like, yeah. it was not laid out like that at all. No, and it no looked problem. like it was, it was all over at, at, at numerous points, but I don't think there was a darker moment than Christmas of 1776. Uh, it was, it was a lot of the founders, you know, they, they really believed that the Providence played a hand in, uh, in mankind's uh, time here on earth. And uh, even Benjamin Franklin, who was uh, not a, a, a great Christian, so, you know, it was, uh, uh, it was destined. It was a providence played a hand in the American Revolution happening the, the way it ended. And, uh, you yeah, know, there's something to that. George Washington, a man for the ages, um, countless battles, bullets flying all around him, other people getting shot, not him. And I, I don't know. I don't want to get too deep into it, but um, there might be something to it. No, I think, I think, you know, and it really is, I mean, this whole gener, I mean, this is the, 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 I mean, the greatest generation of, uh, you know, I mean, obviously of the greatest generation during World War II, but this was really, I mean, the fact that some of these people that you would have uh, as brilliant minds and as stalwart, uh, you know, patriots all coming together at the same time to uh, fashion, you know, something that hadn't been done in world history up to that point since, ancient Rome, ancient Greece and ancient Rome, uh, you know, the idea of setting up a independent republic, uh, federal republic is, uh, is, is pretty amazing. Uh, and it's unprecedented in, uh, at that time. Um, but okay, so we're, yeah, we're getting close to the top of the hour. I do want to oh. know uh, if people want to, uh, what, what's your favorite books on uh, George Washington, if people want to, to read about who Washington was, get a good idea of it. Uh, well, um, Freeman's, Douglas Southall Freeman's uh, six volume set. I uh, have that uh, on my top shelf right there. And then um, this set, um, uh, The Life of George Washington by Washington Irving. And I'll tell you why I love that one. Um, that one was uh, written uh, during the 1800s uh, and um, they had a writing style in the 1800s that was a softer, more romantic type of writing. And uh, um, it, it, it was a gentler way of writing. It was a, a more, uh, uh, they showed more reverence uh, for the greatness of, of others. It seems today we're a bit cynical. Uh, we try to find fault rather than um, find uh, uh, blessings. And uh, Washington Irving, when you read his book, it's, it's, uh, it's not written like it would be written today. Um, uh, some bit flowery perhaps, but uh, it, it's, it gives you a sense of how people, even uh, you know, 60, 70 years after Washington's passing, revered the man because this book wasn't like a one-off where this, oh, only Washington Irving thought that. That's how people thought about George Washington before he became this, you know, this picture in a, in a history book that no one talks about anymore. That's what he meant to the nation back then. And that's what he should mean to the nation today, if you ask me. That's great. Yeah, you know, I I have most biographies on Washington. I do not have the Washington Irving one though. That's a I'll have to. What's your favorite? Uh, so I I I think the Douglas Southall Freeman's the the definitive uh, source. Yeah. But yeah, most people aren't are intimidated by a uh, multi volume thing. I think uh, uh, a good I think the the best single volume one I think is uh, Ron Chernow. I think I think Washington okay. Life does a great job of summing up Washington's life in just 900 pages. Uh, <laughs> but, it's a big you know, volume. <laughs> yeah, but that's if you want to get the, the, the birth to grave story. Um, I mentioned him earlier, Peter Henriquez has written two small volumes that don't do, you know, cradle to grave, but they do explore some of the most interesting aspects of Washington's yeah. life and character uh and his books are first and always and um uh realistic visionary i think those are, are great uh to to flesh out who washington actually was um uh and uh but yeah and, and but washington really i mean he permeates all the literature of the era so whether you're reading 1776 or washington's crossing or any of these great books about uh you know any battles or campaigns i mean washington just comes off the pages everywhere because he's so so crucial to all of that um uh but yeah i you know i, I still think though yeah freeman is 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 the best uh really you know 
gave the subject, uh, you know, most of his time and energy. And, you know, what's great about the internet now is you can access a lot of his letters and writings uh, on Founders Online. Sometimes it's best just to read, write what he was writing. Uh, and, uh, you know, it can be, yeah, very prosaic and flowery. So it's a bit more difficult for us to read, but, uh, but there's nothing like reading what Washington himself actually had to say. Right. Uh, and, uh, and one last question, uh, you know, and people have been asking about the cherry tree and all this other stuff. I will say Mason Weems, you know, book about Washington, you know, comes up with these stories of Washington chopping down the cherry tree and uh, yeah. all these kinds of stories uh, that his modern historians have passed off as uh, fables that uh, he made up uh, to basically actuate, you know, accentuate Washington's virtues. Um, yeah. which, you know, the, the shame of that is Washington's virtues don't really need any embellishment. Uh, right. Right. They already come off there. But I, I you know there is some work being done by some people who are trying to uh, uh, touch on that Mason Weems actually, you know, was living in Virginia at that time period and knew many of the Washington family members. And these stories may not be all completely fabricated. There might be elements of truth in them. Uh, so we'll see if uh, more research is done on that. Um, but but last question, I want uh, best sites to go to uh, if people want to take a trip on President's Day or should I say at the, at Washington's birthday? Washington's uh, birthday, uh, not President's Day. <laughs> correct, you corrected me. Uh, as I said, everybody should correct people. It is Washington's birthday. Uh, uh, what's a good place people can go to learn about the history? Is there a museum or a, or a historic site that you particularly like that you think well, really gets across his story? I suspect I don't know it as much as you. I mean, you're a you're a Washington scholar, and uh, and um, but I would I would say the shrine, uh, Mount Vernon. Um, yeah, it's it's uh, it's like Mecca. I mean, it's just the place <laughs> to go, and uh, the house is there. You can see where he lived. You can see that his uh, his farm where he worked. Uh, they have a beautiful museum. They have a a, a, a strong uh, president running the organization now, Doug, Doug uh, Bradburn and. Uh, the ladies uh, association do a fantastic job um, preserving it. Uh, and they've been doing it since 1853. Uh, um, they are just a, a great group of gals uh, from every state in the union. And, um, and so, yeah, if you've never been to Mount Vernon, you gotta visit uh, and uh, that's where it all happened. What do you think? Uh, I mean, yeah, you, you can't talk about George Washington. You know, going to Mount Vernon is the, the place to do it. Oh, yeah. Uh, and, and yeah, since since even when Washington was alive, people were coming to visit him after yeah. his presidency. I think he had 600 guests in one year uh, come to visit him just because they wanted to see the man, see where he lived. And yeah, even to this day, like I said, it's an amazing site. I think the museum and everything really hammers home the importance of Washington giving up power, why he should be remembered. You know, we're the beneficiary of his sacrifice and uh, his vision for the country. Uh, and yeah, he's, he's buried there and there's uh, nothing more moving than to, you know, it's, it's amazing. You know, you go to England or, you know, uh, France and you see these huge, you know, cathedrals or these giant places where they, they bury their kings and monarchs. And here's Washington in this really kind of simple sarcophagus oh, yeah. on his farm. Uh, and I think it's just the, you know, kings and queens come there to pay their respects to this man who... Uh, you know, did such an extraordinary thing in his life. Um, and yeah, it's a very emotional and powerful place. Um, uh, uh, yeah, so yeah, you got to go to Mount Vernon. Uh, you know, I, th I think even Edward Everett said back in the 1800s, you know, a trip to Washington is but half complete if you don't visit Washington's home and tomb. Um, but, uh, uh, it, you know, if there's other places, like I said, I'm taking my family down to a uh, fairy farm uh, tomorrow. Um, but also uh, uh, last year, uh, myself and Rob went to Washington's birthplace, uh, which is run by the National Park Service. Uh, so I've you can been there. Stand, yep, you can stand on the ground where Washington was born at 10 a.m. on February 22nd. Uh, <laughs> right. So it's kind of cool. And we're, you know, to this year is the 290th anniversary of Washington's birth. So you know, there's going to be a big deal in 10 years. It's going to be the 300th anniversary of his birth. I can only hope that the country, you know puts out as many bells and whistles as they did for the bicentennial 1932 um, because uh, uh, it's definitely, uh, you know, uh, his life was so important to this country. It's only 
uh, fitting that, you know, for the tricentennial, hopefully they, they make a big deal about it. Um, and uh, I know I'm going to try and be there at 10 a.m. on February 22nd in 2032. So right. got it circled on my calendar. But, but yeah, no, are, I think uh... there's plenty of sites you can go, but I think those, those sites are, you know, where Washington lived is, uh, is pretty awesome. That's right. Yeah, the uh, we are sponsoring Americana Corner is sponsoring the national the virtual natural birthday celebration for Mount Vernon uh, for George Washington uh, oh, on the twenty sixth. Yeah, it's kind of fun. We uh, got a little video clip we're going to do in front of the uh, the main speakers and uh, yeah, kind of fun to be involved with the uh, with Mount Vernon people. You know, they're, awesome. they're a class act. Yeah, no, they they, they do a great job. Uh, and uh, yeah, you know, a lot of people are surprised that it's not a it's not a federal or a state organization that runs it. It's a private group that yeah has been and they were kind of the trendsetters. You know, they uh, and Pamela yeah. Cunningham originally reached out. That's to right, them. very they good. And they, yeah. they said they said there's no such thing as it. it historic house museums didn't even exist. So uh, <laughs> it was it was visionary uh, what those women did. Um, and yeah. it's yeah they, they're they're still at it to this day. So uh, keeping yep. his memory alive there so good um but anyways yeah no, thank you tom uh for joining us this evening thank you everybody for checking us out like i said check out tom's group americana corner uh and uh we'll be back here in two weeks um but thank you all for joining us thanks mark <laughs>